again and welcome back to the second half of chapter six. So now we're going to talk about uh, thermal regulation, um, how our, we basically use our skin to thermal regulate. Um, also, we're going to talk about what happens when we get cut and how all that works. And we're going to talk about burns. And then we're going to talk about how dumb our body is when it comes to forming scars. Because our body is kind of stupid. This is where one of the places I like to get on my, my crazy stand of, yeah, there's a lot of beautiful things and elegant things in science that, you know, but there's also a lot of things that just are like mother nature kind of like half rear ended it on us and it shows, <laughs> you know, it gets the job done, but not very well. This is one of those spots, which is weird because, yeah, some uh, mammals don't get scars, but we do. Weird. We're going to get into that. Monty gets scars, too, actually, so don't feel too bad. He actually has a scar um, on his tail. Let me see if I can show it to you. Is it on your other side? I can't see, Monty. Monty's probably like, I just got comfy, Mommy. Why are you doing this to me? So what happened was uh, Monty actually got uh, attacked by a mouse. This is why he doesn't get uh, live mice anymore um, or ever, in my opinion. You should never feed a snake live mice if you're keeping one for a pet. Uh, I know a lot of people like to do it because they're like, watch them battle. It's like, no, dude, if you want a nice, calm snake, feed them dead, warm it back up, use tongs. They don't know the difference. Monty, he doesn't know the difference. So you just wiggle the dead mouse or dead rat in front of him, and Monty's like, oh, food. So what happened was, yeah, somebody before I got him uh, fed him, and I don't know if you can see it, but right here, see where his scales are all messed up? Yeah, that's where a uh, mouse turned around and started chewing on Monty, because mice actually have to continuously chew. A lot of rodents and uh, family rodentia have to do that because their teeth are constantly growing. And even with beavers, um, if beavers can't chew, their teeth will actually curl around and grow right through their skull. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so uh, a lot of rodentia have to keep chewing because their teeth keep growing. Um, so a rat or a mouse that um, is not being eaten by the snake, if the snake's afraid of it, like Monty is, he's a big fat baby, um, he only eats dead, um, they actually will chew um, on. Um, uh, <laughs> the snake, and if Monty, being the, the big fat baby that Monty is, he just curled in the ball and went, don't hurt me, don't hurt me, go away. And so that's how he got a scar. So, so yeah. But there's other mammals that don't get scars. Okay. Thanks. Anyway, so let's go ahead and get started in talking about these things. So first I want to talk about aging in your skin, which is why I, I again, Google image search brings me the strangest <laughs> images. So I was trying to look for like aged skin, but not look like find something like totally creepy until I found this woman looking totally creepy. So I just said, yeah, I've got to use this totally creepy lady because it looks like they transported her head onto a different body because this skin here looks way too smooth for her head. I, I just... Photoshop, definitely. Anyway, moving on. So anyway, remember, what does your skin do for you? Well, it uh, helps maintain homeostasis in your body. It keeps the outside out and the inside safe and inside, so that way we can regulate it. Oh, hi, Monty. What's up? Yes, I agree. Anyway, prevents water loss. Uh, yeah, we're, we're mostly made of water, and the last thing we want to do is lose it. Because uh, as I was saying uh, earlier, when I was talking about alcohol and the antidiuretic hormone, I gave an example in a couple of lectures ago. Yeah, you don't, you don't want to lose your water. Uh, water good. Water good. So it absorbs stuff, which can be good or bad. Uh, a lot of times it's good. A lot of times, it's, and sometimes it's bad, like uh, mercury, as I mentioned, I uh, forget which class I mentioned this in now, because I, I do a lot of these lectures back to back to back for both classes. Um, and that is the story of, yeah, liquid mercury, 
uh, does not play well with our body. Um, unfortunately, our body, again, this is a, a land of why our body is dumb. Example, um, if liquid mercury gets absorbed into your skin, it actually uh, goes through and um, uh, <laughs> our body's like, I, I don't know what to do with this. So it takes it and actually covers our neurons with it, our, our brain cells and our nervous cells. So, And then when they're covered, they can't talk to each other because remember I mentioned uh, back in chapter five that they ha they don't touch. They get really, 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 really close, but they don't touch. Um, and the crazy part is, is if they're covered, they can't release the neurotransmitters between them to do signals, which we're gonna learn more about in chapter 10, chapter 11, chapter 12. Um, so mercury covers it and suddenly the brain cells can't talk to each other. And if your brain cells can't talk to each other, you can't do everything that keeps you alive. So that's where the you know, mad as a hatter comes from because uh, we used to use liquid mercury to shape all those beautiful, crazy big hats they used to wear back in the day. So the hatters, the people that would make it, would actually dip their hands constantly in it. So anyway. And then the, the first emperor of China, he went crazy and died because they kept telling, sages kept telling him, uh, that you know they'd make these these elixirs of life that would let him live for eternal life because his own kids and his wives were out were constantly trying to kill him for his throne so that was like no wonder the guy was paranoid already but then it made it worse because they kept giving him the elixir of eternal life and it had mercury in it and then he went crazy and died so anyway liquid mercury don't let your skin absorb it anyway uh, protects you from harmful stuff, you know. Again, it keeps the outside out and the inside in. Um, makes vitamin D, which is something we need, so, which is why I, occasionally even nerds like me have to step outside and stand in the sun for a good 15 minutes because it not only helps your mood, um, it's, you know, not a, a, a cure for true depression, but it still helps. Um, but it also lets you make vitamin D. So you do actually need some sunshine in your life. Um, you know, so just saying, yeah, occasionally we need to go outside where the bright burning ball of hydrogen is in the sky. So we do need some radiation. Not a lot though. Uh, regulates your body temperature, which is what we're going to go into next. So you have to maintain a stable body temperature for a reason. And our, you know, internal body temperature is usually around 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, usually. Everybody's slightly different up or down. Um, and also different ages kind of have slightly different off uh, averages as well. Um, I like my son. He's a little heater. Um, so anyway, and a slight change can really mess everything up, which is why fevers can be so devastating. So... Um, you know, to keep all your enzymes happy and working. Because remember, your enzymes, as I mentioned in previous chapters, they have one job, usually, and they're really good at it. And they have to have certain conditions to work in. Like, for instance, uh, amylase, which is an enzyme that hangs out in our, um, on our spit, in our, um, the juices in our mouth that I can't think of the technical term for all of a sudden. Anyway, they live in here. And, um, you know, uh, they're very happy in a pH of around 7 because that's usually saliva. That's your saliva. Oh, my goodness. So, anyway, your saliva. And they usually hang out in a pH of 7. But like I just did when I drank some water and I, you know, well, some of the amylase in my saliva went down with that and went down into my stomach, which has a pH of 2. Now, you have a lot of enzymes hanging out in your stomach to break everything down, but amylase can't work in a pH of 2. He'll actually explode and not work anymore, which is called denaturing. Um, however, your, um, you know, all the enzymes that are hanging out in my uh, stomach acid, which has a pH of 2, or, they love that. That's their happy place. If you took them out and put them in a glass of water, which has a pH of 7, they too would stop working because they're not in the right temperature and they're not in the right pH. So remember, enzymes are very dependent on temperature and pH for them to work properly. So temperature, that's why we have to maintain an internal body temperature. Unlike Monty, who is an exotherm, that's why he's all snuggled up against my neck and that's why if you come into the lab at some point, you can see uh, 
uh, Monty has heating lamps in his house and heating pads in his other house at my house and um, to keep him warm because he can't generate internal heat like we can. He needs uh, heat from outside sources to keep him warm and keep his metabolism running. Right? Right. So we're endotherms because we make our own heat. He's an exotherm because uh, he needs somebody else like the sun or heating pads or heating lamps to keep him warm. Right? Right. That's actually if he gets too cold, he can die. Uh, anything other 50 degrees Fahrenheit, he could go into shock and die. So that's why I keep him at a happy temperature of try to keep him around 80. But it's usually between 70 to 80. I'm working on trying to get him more humidity, though. He needs that, don't you? Yeah. He's getting older. It helps him. All right. So there's basically four different ways uh, heat moves around. Um, and I'm going to get into space again because I love talking about space. So the four main things we care about in getting heat loss and, and stuff is these four radiations. So this is basically losing heat in infrared rays. Um, we feel radiation. I don't know if you've ever been to a bonfire and before you even get anywhere near the fire, you start feeling it coming off, the heat coming off, especially if it's a big bonfire or if you've been next to a really big fire. Um, like one time we were driving down the road and um, there was a house fire that we just happened to be driving past. And thankfully the fire department was already there and working on putting it out and they were directing traffic, kind of, you know, making sure nobody was, you know, getting out and rubbernecking. But uh, because of that, it kind of backed up traffic. And because of this, you could feel the heat coming off of that house fire. It was intense and that's the radiation. So even before you're anywhere near the fire, that's what you feel is that radiation coming off. Now, conduction um, is basically when heat moves from the body directly into cooler surfaces. So like for instance, when you get into your bed and it's cold because nobody's been in the bed and you're like, oh, ah, you're getting cold, and that, that, then the, the bed starts to warm up from your own body heat. That's conduction. We also have, you know, um, uh, conduction stoves where basically, you know, it has the, the round thing where, you know, it heats up in the middle and then it goes around the coil, you know. Again, heat moves directly into cooler surfaces, or actually, yeah, convection. Anyway, so convection is heat release uh, into the air. Warm air goes up, cold air moves down. This is why hot air balloons work because all the gas is inside. You know, we got that big flamethrower that basically warms up all the air and it makes it more excited and has more energy and it becomes less dense and therefore the hot air balloon floats up. Um, and then last but not least, this is why we sweat, evaporation. Because when we sweat, it makes sweat, it dries. And that, that uh, shift uh, between liquid water and turning into gas. So the uh, water turning from, the salty water turning from liquid to gas takes energy to do that. And that takes the energy away from us and cools us down. So that's why we sweat. Um, not all animals could sweat, and you know, like dogs have to pant, cats pant too. Uh, Monty doesn't have to worry about that. He just has to worry about staying warm. But uh, mammals usually have to worry about overheating. That comes with the risk of being endothermic, exothermic. They're just worried about staying heated. Anyway, now, fun thing about space. The only one of these four that works in space is radiation. And I know you've probably seen movies where people get accidentally sucked out to space and they freeze instantly. Doesn't happen. Heat conduction is really poor in space. It's actually one of our biggest concerns in um, actually making spaceships and flying for long time, uh, periods of time away from places is the heat buildup. You, the only thing in space that, that you can get rid of heat is through radiation, and radiation actually is terrible. Compared to convection and conduction, these two are an amazing way to get rid of heat and evaporation too, which is why we sweat in the first place. But these, these, three, don't ev these three don't happen in space. Only radiation has, and it's really bad at just getting rid of energy. Really bad. Uh, it takes forever. So you do not insta-freeze in space. So if you get kicked out into space, you're going to pop because of pressure differences, but you're not going to freeze. 
So all the movies you see where they, they go into space and they freeze to death, yeah, that doesn't happen. That cannot happen. That's not how it happens. We're actually worried about making ships that generate too much heat because we could actually boil our own um, spaceships inside alive because we've got to figure out a way to get heat from inside generated by just naturally doing things outside of the spaceship and away from the spaceship so we don't turn it into a pretty much uh, superheated sauna where we all die. So yeah, that's another issue for space travel is heat conduction how to get rid of heat, because in space, the only way you can lose heat is through radiation, and it's terrible. So, yay for living on a planet, even though I, I want to go into space. All right, but anyway, so there you go. So that's how, that's basically the basics of how heat moves around, especially in your body. So, and we're gonna come back to this boy, our friend, the hypothalamus. So internal temperature is regulated by our hypothalamus. He's a major, he's a major controller. He, he, we'll talk about him over and over again, especially next semester. He's kind of pretty much in control of our endocrine system, so. So it's basically a part of our brain. And he monitors, and, and basically it's a negative feedback how we maintain our internal temperature. Where again, remember we talked about what a negative feedback is, whenever a change occurs, we react and then bring it back to the normal area. So, uh, from two sets of thermoreceptors, one's in the brain that monitor our internal temperature and one's in our skin that tell us about the temperature outside of our body. Like this lab, most labs are always cold. So right now I'm not feeling terribly hot and neither is Monty because he's outside of his house and that's why he's very cuddly up to my neck right now. Um, because labs are usually kept cold for a variety of reasons. So labs are not always the warmest, the greatest place. You know, if you really need to co cool off, go to a lab. <laughs> that, that every lab is going to let you in, but I'm just saying there's, there's a reason. Uh, so right now I'm kind of cold. So my, my hairs are kind of up on my arms. I don't have goose pimples yet, but I'm close to it. Anyway, um, but that's telling me my hypothalamus is like, I'm cold. So right now I'm feeling cold and I'm pretty much, my body is going, you know what? Maybe you should go somewhere warm or put a jacket on. And, um, so that's basically what's regulating our internal temperature. If our, you know, if, if we get an internal temperature, like I said, or usually it's uh, 37 degrees Celsius or 98.6 degrees, and our hypothalamic has the set point. And so basically what happens is our body temperature rises, um, you know, above normal, if it's really hot outside, um, our nervous system sits there and, and tells basically, uh, hey, we're getting too hot on the inside, all our enzymes are getting unhappy, so let's cool down. So we start sweating. And then we start vasodilating, which means all of our um, capillaries in our body and everything open up so that way we lose more heat that way by making our blood flow faster through our body. So we lose heat that way. And then that should hopefully drop our body temperature down back to what it should be. So, you know, it doesn't disrupt all our enzymes doing their jobs. Same thing for getting too cold, our body temperature uh, drops below normal and we start getting nervous signals to constrict, which is happening right now in my body, which is why my fingers are cold, because uh, uh, they've all constricted. Instead of you know, opening up and losing, uh, losing heat, they've, they're starting to vasoconstrict, which is they get and they, uh, so that way not a lot of blood is getting through, uh, through the extremities, so therefore my fingers are cold. Um, and if the body temperature continues to drop, it usually makes us start shivering, which is the, uh, you know, makes our muscles uh, try to generate heat. In that way, uh, body heat is conserved, and then hopefully it rises back up. So that's basically what, why, uh, you know, our skin is a major player in this huge figure eight of maintaining our normal body temperature. Now, if you get too high, it's called hypothermia. And the special type of this, of course, is a fever which is kind of like um, the nuclear option of our body, which again, we'll get into that when we talk about the immune system in the next semester, which is actually kind of cool to talk about, I think. Anyway, um, and if you get too cold, it's hypothermia. And people die of both all the time, especially the young and the old, they're very susceptible to both of these, which is why, you know, when there's a huge heat wave, we often, you know, make sure that the elderly and the young are usually in the in colder places, so that way they can survive. Um, and us, you know, mid-range, 
people, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Same thing when, like, you know, when the power goes out in the winter and, like, you know, make sure everybody's nice and warm because you don't want people to go into hypothermia. So there you go. Monty, on the other hand, can definitely go into hypothermia. I don't know about hyperthermia with snakes. There's got to be a point to it. But anyway, let's talk about getting cut. So we're going to get into this more, actually, when we talk about uh, later in the course. Not so much this semester, but next semester, we go right back over this again, and we get into some more nitty-gritty details, which is really interesting, um, with all how uh, platelets work and blood clots work and all that fun stuff. So there's basically four stages to how skin heals after being cut. So say you get a, a paper cut, which I, I find are the most annoying cuts on the universe, um, and that is uh, you get hemostasis, which starts instantly after the wound. And that's basically what happens is um, when anything rips open, it leaves jaggedness. And um, our platelets in our blood are very, very sticky. So whenever there's a jagged opening that's not supposed to be there, the platelets will all like catch it and, and hang on and grab onto it. And then they start, you know, and then they grab onto each other. And because of this, it forms a plug. And so that's what's to stop the bleeding first. And then inflammation, what happens is the skin cells, because they've been broken unnaturally, start putting out chemicals that start in, in basically signaling white blood cells to move in and start cleaning up. But it also makes everything swell up. And that swelling is to do two things. It's to slow down the blood flow. So we're, again, we're not losing blood. But it's also to put, uh, push those pieces that have been cut back together a bit. So then you get proliferation. This is where you get granulation to, uh, tissues such as the epithelial cells go crazy and start uh, replacing um, the area that was destroyed and um, building it back in. And under on that, you get maturation, which is a ton of the plug material is moved and you get a new layer of skin after when the scab falls out. Or if you're like me, you just keep picking up the scab like a genius. I don't know why it's a thing. I'm just like, eh. I've been trying to keep my hands off things, but you know. Anyway, so those are the four parts of basically how we heal a cut. Now we're gonna go into this even more way later down the road. So don't, you know, go, oh, okay. But you know, trust me, we're, getting, we're gonna get into some more nitty gritties a little later. Um, now let's talk about burns. Uh, burns are classified in the extent of how much tissue damage you've done. So basically you got your first degree or superficial partial thickness burn. Usually your first degree is hurting your epidermis and your dermis. It really hasn't gotten down to your subcutaneous. Um, your dermis might be slightly upset or at least the upper half of your derma, uh, dermis. So, you know, first degree burn is, is like, you know, me cooking or B, um, and I can cook. I, I'm really good at the, uh, the crock pot foo, but sometimes me and the oven get into fights. Anyway, um, we've gotten better, uh, but us uh, yeah, sunburns are usually a first degree burn. Um, stuff like that, or like, you know, when I accidentally touch something that's too hot and then you go run it under cold water. I know you're supposed to run it under uh, lukewarm water more, but I always, you know, stick it under water helps. Uh, second degree uh, or partial, deep partial thickness burn. This unfortunately has gone down and damaged the epidermis and the dermis and is making a lovely blister and is not fun to deal with. Do not run this underwater. Um, third degree or full thickness burn. This means you pretty much killed the, the layers right down to the basement to beyond the subcutaneous. You've, you've drilled down accidentally through all of your skin, which unfortunately means you've got to get a graft um, if you want, because you've killed that skin, it's not going to grow back. Um, so this is where skin grafts come into play. And there's actually uh, two different types of grafts. There's an autograft and an allograft. The autograft is usually skin that comes from another part of the body on the same person. For instance, my grandmother is a cancer survivor. She had skin cancer because, as in her own words, to get that beautiful color, uh, that nice olive color that was so the rage when she was young, um, she'd slather herself up in butter, I kid you not, and go roast herself outside. Now keep in mind, look how pasty pale I am. Yeah. Anyway, so... 
Yeah, she gave herself skin cancer that way. Um, we all get it eventually. Uh, some, you know, usually it's benign. Um, you know, I got checked over by my dermatologist. He checked me over. I've actually got it, my own skin condition. It's, it's nothing bad. It's just apparently my skin likes to make red spots. Why couldn't it be another color? I want cooler spots. Oh, well. Darn. Anyway, so this comes from another part of the body on the same person. So what they did with her is they had to actually uh, take the cancerous spots off and they took uh, skin from the back of her calves. And there's a really cool device for it to take it off. It's, it's, it looks like a, a funky cheese grater on a wheel. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Probably some, some of you may have. Um, I usually have some students that, that get to see some of the in, more interesting things up in the hospitals because that's where they work. Um, so maybe you've seen it, maybe you haven't, but basically they come through and they, they pick up the skin, like they usually pick up like a couple of layers uh, down to the, the living part of the epidermis, and then they graft it on and um, then it grows in because it's the same skin just from a different part of the body it usually takes pretty well unless the damage is just absolutely insane um, but that's an autograft autograft it comes skin comes from the same person okay allograft means the can the skin comes from somebody else um, now interestingly enough we're looking at right now um, Allografts from fish actually have been working really well on burn victims. Uh, so we might have another use for the tilapia. And by the way, the tilapia is a real fish. I don't know why people keep putting out, oh, they, they, they invented the tilapia. No, the tilapia has been a, it not, it's not a creature that was created by humans. It's a tilapia. Uh -huh. Anyway, so I don't know why people are funky. They just eat poo. That's their thing. That's why we raise them in fisheries alongside salmon and everything, because they keep the tank clean. Yeah, anyway. So anyway, so we've been looking at actually taking fish skin. For whatever reason, uh, we actually respond well to fish skin grafts. They work, they, there's been, we've been looking in at it, and yeah, we don't turn into, we don't get scales. We don't turn into fish. I know all the mermaid lovers are out there going, darn. But um, no, actually, it, it just, for whatever reason, it really promotes um, and gives a, an area for uh, the rest of the skin to grow back over it. So we've actually seen some success in treating third degree burns with fish skin. I know it seems crazy, but it's true. So allograft, usually the skin comes from another human in an allograft. But um, um, I've been seeing promising research. I haven't look back into it in a few years though about using fish skin to uh, help third degree burns because you know it's hard to find you know other people's skin that your body doesn't try to instantly reject then because keep in mind it's you know you do have tissue rejection um, which is never good when you're trying to grow parts of your body back and your body's too busy going get it out of here we don't want it it's like uh, no you need it no no it's not of us so make it go away we'll kill it if you do so. Yeah, rejection. We don't want rejection. These two videos are really useful. I wish I could show them here, but unfortunately for me uploading these videos, um, it goes over how wounds heal. Uh, they show a lot of how the fibrogen fibers come in and how everything's made. Do you need to know all these steps at nauseum? No, I'm not gonna beat you with this. But it is useful. I find these videos very nice. I like them a lot. Um, this one goes over, this one, they kind of overlap. Um, it's from, these are from Ted Ed. They do overlap very much. Um, this one talks more about scar formation. And I was gonna get into how the body is dumb. You see, we have a nice cross hatching. If you remember me showing those slides a couple lectures ago, they were really have a nice cross hatching of, you know, the collagen fibers and the elastin fibers in your skin, in the, you know, in the connective tissues. Um, and that beautiful cross hatching uh, gives us a, you know, perfect stretch and elasticity. But when we cut it, for whatever reason, the cells that come back in and start laying, the fibroblasts that come in and start laying down the fiber, uh, the, the collagen and the fibrin uh, again, do not make a nice cross hatch anymore. They just do it in one direction. And that's why we get scars. And it looks terrible because 
we're just like, okay, we're gonna, you know, do you want us to make this beautiful cross-hatching pattern? And the fibrogen cells are just like, nah, I'll just do it in one direction. So that's why scars look so terribly different from, you know, skin, because uh, regular skin, because it's not built well. It's just kind of like a slap dap, there you go, oh well, have fun. And that's why scars are, you know, uh, they're just not as, they're not a very good replacement. It's kind of one of our places where our body is stupid. Um, and I mean that. Um, because like I was mentioning earlier, um, other mammals don't get scars. Deer, for instance, deer, um, and they'll mention that in this video, deer actually do not get scars. They actually, their fibroblast cells, for whatever reason, actually put down, um, you know, an ac actual mimic of what, you know, they're born with, you know, that perfect skin, and they don't get scars, which is just like, huh. Now, that also means, you know, they can't qu get cool scarification things, but, you know, some people are into that, like tattoos and whatnot, which is totally fine, you know. Everybody do everybody, as long as you don't harm anybody. Um, so, uh, but yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, so our, our human skin is dumb in the fact that, yeah, we make scars and we don't know why our fibrin, our fibrogen our cells are kind of stupid versus deer fibrogen cells, which actually, you know, actually fix the skin. So maybe in the future we can crack that a little better and then we could figure out, you know, if you want the scar, cool. If you don't want the scar, we could fix it. So here's to the future. Hopefully we'll figure it out. Maybe fix that part of the body that's like, what, what were you thinking? And the fibrogen cells are sitting there going, uh. <laughs> so, so there you go. There's your integumentary system in a nutshell. I hope you enjoyed. Um, and I'll see you next week when we talk about, I believe we're going to be talking about, here, hold on, let's go look. Let's go look. We're going to be talking about skeletal system and joints. Woo! So bones. So next week, bones. All right, with that said. But I'm not done yet. Oh, I'm back because I, I did psych. I forgot, it's, I forgot one slide. My bad. So let me just really quickly, don't run away. Don't, don't, don't leave me. Um, let me do this real quick. That is aging. So aging. So anyway, um, so aging takes a toll on one's skin. The epidermis thins, hairs thin, less melanin made, follicles decrease, you get age spots. Uh, the dermis also becomes reduced and elastin collagen is made less. We get wrinkles, fewer fibroblasts. So healing slower, decrease in oil makes our skin dry out more, um, less sensory receptors. So uh, less response to pain and cold and heat changes. This uh, older folks are more sensitive and vulnerable to temperature changes because they don't really realize the temperature has changed terribly much. Like, you know, sometimes they're just always cold no matter what. Even if it's actually really hot out, they're just always cold. So um, that doesn't necessarily mean they are cold. Um, it just means that they're always feeling cold. And, you know, that's again why, you know, older folks are very vulnerable to huge, like, you know, heat surges and um, also, you know, wintry uh, storm attacks when, you know, power goes down for either reason. So, yep. Almost forgot to talk about getting old. Sorry about that. I almost skipped a section. So with that said, for realsies this time, bye. Have a good one.